entrepreneurs will save the world. We chat with successful entrepreneurs who share their journey and the lessons learned along the way. The Add Value to Entrepreneurs podcast is edutaining, leaving you with actionable advice to transform your life and create a thriving business that aligns with your values and goals. Our conversations are for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life they desire. We focus on the mindset shifts entrepreneurs make to increase their influence and impact in the world. It's time for you to add value. This episode is brought to you by the Add Value to Entrepreneurs podcast. We would love for you to like, share, and leave a review of our show. Subscribe on YouTube. Most importantly, help us spread the word about the great stories being shared on our show. Today's guest is Jerome Myers. Are you stuck in the matrix? Many of us are silently asking ourselves, is there more to life? Jerome Myers, a.k.a. J., is a developer of people and places. He is the founder and chief inspiration officer of two ventures. Dreamcatchers is a boutique coaching firm that supports first and second generation wealth creators to self-actualize and attain transcendence. And the Myers Development Group, where we help ordinary people invest in multifamily real estate in a way that creates generational wealth. Jerome Myers and Robert talk about the matrix and how taking the red pill is really about intentionality and education. You have a choice to take responsibility for your life and business, and you can choose to learn about money and how to put it to work for you rather than doing just what everyone else thinks is right. Jerome, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I appreciate you. Looking forward to just learning new strategies and uh, having a great conversation. Mr. Peterson, it's good to be with you, brother. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So typically I just let everyone start each episode with their own entrepreneurial journey and how you got started in and got to what you're doing now. Yeah. You, you, you make me get a little, ah, when we start having that conversation because I did it the wrong way. <laughs> I, uh, I dropped out, right? So I was in corporate America. I just built a pretty large division. I was employee number two. We went up to about 175 folks in nine months. And by the end of the year, we'd done about 20 million in revenue with 30% profit margins. And I get a phone call on December 24th at 4.55 that says, uh, hey, Jerome, we're going to lay them off. It's like, what are you talking about? No, we're not. That's not the right answer after those types of results. He said, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to do. I said, no, that's not what we're going to do. And it went from lighthearted to very serious pretty quickly. And it ended with, Jerome, this isn't a debate. This isn't a discussion. This isn't a negotiation. I've made my mind up. This is what we're going to do. And then the phone call ended. And I realized at that point that although I thought I was in charge, although I thought I was the guy running the business, I wasn't. And that for me was a shock to my system. And so after I, I kind of picked my jaw up off the ground and started figuring out how I was going to make the process of laying people off as objective as possible, I realized that, yeah, there was some fat and we did need to let some of the people go, but there were some really good people who were being impacted negatively and we had plenty of cash. I mean, $6 million of cash where we could have figured out something to help those people move on to another way in helping the business. Hmm. And so we put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We made another run. And it was standing in front of the room a couple of days before Black Friday that I felt like I lost all my leadership credibility because I was telling people not to spend all their money over the weekend, not sure what's going to happen between then and the end of the year. And I decided that I was going to exit corporate America at that point because I didn't feel like I actually had control over the business that I was running. It felt really good to be an entrepreneur without all the responsibilities but I truly wasn't an entrepreneur. And I got reminded of that when big decisions had to be made. And so I dropped out and I had this wild idea that I would go buy apartment buildings and be a real estate investor and ran into some hurdles and some headaches along that journey because I didn't really have a plan. I didn't have somebody to help me along the way. And both of those things were extremely important for me as I began to scale my business, but in the beginning, it was just a mess. <laughs> oh, 
Well, sometimes in the mess is, is what forces us to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly a message there. And for anybody who's listening, I, I think the big thing is if you're trying to get something going, uh, talking to somebody who's already done it and has done it well is really valuable. The ability to condense decades into days to eliminate some of the potholes you're hit while driving the car and in a lot of ways prevent yourself from running into a brick wall while you're driving, it's really, really important. And I think a lot of us are overly confident. Uh, I call it unconsciously incompetent. <laughs> and in that space, we make a bunch of decisions that only get in the way of our business becoming what we truly desire for it to become. Well, and the challenge in that space is, is the, the thought that you think you know what you're doing. Oh yeah. And then, and then when, when somebody says something or you hear something, your brain says, Oh, we know it. And we ignore, we ignore what they're saying because these, Oh, I think I got it. Right. <laughs> so we miss out on some learning opportunities just because our brain automatically says, Oh, I think I got it. The brain thinks I got it. And some of the people around us may think we've got it. And, you know, that's part of the ego. And there's nothing wrong with getting wise counsel. I think a lot of us want cheap opinions instead <laughs> of wise counsel. And that leads to very, very expensive mistakes in our businesses. Hmm. So it's always my encouragement to anybody who's either looking to scale or thinking about starting that they get wise counsel because it may sound like a lot of money when you are having that discussion with this professional who's got this experience, who's going to help you go to where you want to go. But it's very, very cheap in comparison of you building a business that does not work or creating a situation where you can't absolutely grow into the space that you desire to be in. So how do you find that mentor? How do you find that that person that can can lead you, guide you, keep you from falling in the trench? Very carefully. I think a lot of people uh, go and find the cheapest option, right? Because they want to, they're investors, they're being wise with their money. And what I found, especially in real estate, whenever I hire the cheapest contractor it ends up being the most expensive option every single time and so when you you go get the book instead of buying the course or you get the course instead of working one-on-one -on -one with the person you end up in a space where you don't know what you don't know you're self-educating and i could tell you i was never very good at that and it was very often that i found out that i thought i understood something that i didn't and in business when that happens it costs you time and money and sometimes it can cost you more time and money than you actually have. <laughs> and so what I really do encourage folks to do is find somebody who's actually been down the path that you want to go down, find somebody who has the same morals and values that you have, and then actually spend time consuming their content because they should be publishing on a regular basis, whether it's written or video, to really get an understanding of who they are, what they value, and how they can actually help you. A lot of folks read a book and then they're an expert on something. It's just not true. You want to work with a practitioner, right? Somebody who's actually in the craft of doing the thing or has done the thing. And those people are most likely to give you actionable, real-time feedback that's going to prevent you from getting in a mess. Nice. So what was your biggest challenge in that first year? <laughs> All the money was going the wrong way, sir. <laughs> uh, real estate is, is a capital intensive business, right? And so I was buying property. Well, I was trying to buy property. So the first year, <laughs> I was thinking about the second. The first year, I had this wild idea that I was just going to go buy an apartment building. And so I went to the first bank and said, hey, don't you want to give me a million dollars so I can go buy this property? He said, why would we ever do that? <laughs> and I said, well, I just got done running a big business and I'm a licensed engineer and I got an MBA. They said, yeah, we don't care about any of that. I said, well, 
what do you do what do you care about they said well we want to know that you have executed this business plan of a on a property of similar size I said uh all right let me start reaching in my pocket I said, uh i got this lint because i don't have any of that experience and they said well until you find somebody that can partner with you on it or you have that experience we're not going to give you a million dollars for that property and so I was like, okay, they're just being rude. I'm going to go to the next one. And so they said, no, just like the first bank told me the same reason. Third, fourth, fifth, all the same answers. Now, I'm stubborn, sir. So I kept going. And I got up to number 10, and then I realized, hey, maybe I'm crazy. This goes back to not having a mentor, right? Not having a formal course. I was watching videos, listening to podcasts, and I thought that I had this thing licked. I thought I knew what I was doing, but I didn't. And so in that moment, I realized that I did not have what it was going to take. I didn't have the network in order to get into the building. And so I did a pivot, started fixing and flipping, bought houses. But with a fix and flip property, you buy it, you put all the money in, everybody gets paid but you until you actually sell the property. And so that first year, that's what I did. I, I bought properties, put money into properties, but I didn't sell anything. and my savings was beginning to dwindle and I started asking questions like, is this going to work? Am I doing the right thing? All right. So how do we push past that? Well, we see the projects to, through. We realized that we knew what we were doing from a mathematical standpoint. We get to the exit, we get some cash back and we figure out how to do more. But the flips and flips weren't what was really valuable outside of getting an understanding of construction and taking the time to get my general contractor's license. What was really valuable was when a guy pulled up in his white Dodge Ram pickup truck at my 1920s built Foursquare, where we were doing everything from the HVAC to the plumbing to the electricity, all brand new. And he gets out of his truck, he walks up, through the grass he says hey man i'd love to see your finishes because we're getting ready to do a house down the street and so you know i'm proud at this point because somebody actually wanted to see the work that we were doing and after being rejected by the bank i didn't actually think anybody cared about what we were doing so this was first confirmation for me so we walk in and he's like oh you tucked the wall out and that island is huge and you didn't do level one, granted. This is like level five or six. And you got the gooseneck sink in this island, too. Like, this is really well done. We go upstairs. He's like, man, that towel in the bathroom is really nice. And look at this flooring. I, I haven't seen anything like this in a while. We're walking back down the stairs. And he's getting ready to walk out the front door. And he stops in the threshold. And he says, hey, do you know anything about that building behind the Chimbo Mart? And this is one of the first buildings I tried to why i said yeah the 23 unit apartment building yeah absolutely i know a lot about that building he said well i'm gonna make an offer on it later today i said oh man wait you're the guy i've been looking for they told me i needed an experience partner and there's no way you're making an offer on the deal if you don't have experience and he kind of looked at me he said we own a little something i said so don't leave me out i need you to be in the deal. He said, well, what are you going to bring to the table? He said, I, I don't know. That part doesn't matter. Don't leave me out of the deal. You're the guy I've been looking for. The bank said I need an experience partner. He said, yeah, I hear you, but what are you going to bring to the table? I said, listen, man, I've been looking for you for at least six months when the, they told me they weren't going to give me a loan on the property. I want to be in the deal with you. Don't leave me out. And he asked me one more time. What are you going to bring to the table? I said, look, we'll figure it out. Just don't leave me out. And so he turns red. He gets frustrated. He shuts his, shuts, shakes his head, walks down the stairs, through the grass, hops in his truck, drives off. And I'm like, this is amazing. I finally got my partner, right? I finally have the experienced partner that I've been looking for. And so time passes. This is Wednesday when this happened. Thursday comes and goes. I'm like, okay, they just need to negotiate a little bit more. Tomorrow's the day. Friday, nothing. I was like, oh, they just had to work through the contract through the weekend. Monday rolls around, comes and goes, nothing. Tuesday, I'm like, all right, what's going on? This guy can't be leaving me out the deal. 
Still nothing. Friday of the next week comes in. I'm looking there and I'm sitting and I realize I don't even have the guy's phone number to follow up with him. So I just realized that my opportunity to do the deal slipped away and I'm pretty bummed. And so we keep working on the house, keep working on the house. And Tuesday rolls around and the guy I used to lend money to when I was in corporate America, who was another rehabber in the area said, Hey, I got an opportunity to be a general contractor on the project that you and I talked about five or six months ago. I told them I was only willing to do it if you were a part of the deal. All right, man, what are we doing? Where are we going? Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., this location, I'm there. And so the three of us, the guy who didn't call me because I couldn't tell him what I was going to bring to the table, the guy who I helped out in the past, we put a partnership together. We added in the broker and a property manager. And the five of us bought this deal for like $1.3 million. And that's how the apartment business really got started. And that's how the team got structured. But the thing that was important for me was I ended up being the asset manager. And because I was the asset manager, I got interviewed. And that interview ended up in the business journal. That business journal is read by all of the commercial real estate brokers or commercial loan officers in the city. Because my name was in that article, those folks started reaching out and they wanted to know what else I had in the pipeline, what we were going to do with this deal once we got done with the construction and going down the list. So much so that they wanted to have lunch with me so that they could show me what their products were. Now, I didn't know banks had products. I thought they had loans. I didn't know what a pipeline was. I had a deal. And I was like, everything changed for me because magically we closed on a property. And that for me put my whole life in a different stratosphere because we actually closed the deal. And we leveraged those relationships, started building a portfolio in a different city. And that's kind of the trajectory that we went on. But it all started from a bunch of mistakes, right? Because if you're an entrepreneur, you can't articulate the value you can contribute to a potential partnership. Why would anybody partner with you? This isn't charity work. Nobody wants to split the pie up with more people than they absolutely have to. And if you're not able to share what your value is, then why would they do that with you? Well, I think that's a challenge for a lot of entrepreneurs that, especially in the new, this new online space, this new education yeah. error, info, information error that they, they can't articulate their value and they can't, you know, it, 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 with a plumber, it's easy, right? Like the pipe's broken, I'll fix the pipe. Yeah. <laughs> the AC's broken, I'll fix the AC. It will work again when we're done. You, you know, there's the values obvious, but, but for education space and for some of those, you know, we can't make promises, right? Of income, you can't you can't make promises that you know you'll double or triple your income. Although some people, you know, unscrupulously put those kind of promises out there. Um, but being able to to state what the value is that you bring, you know, so that's a great question to be asked, right? What is the value you're bringing to the table? What is the value that that you're, you know, I'm giving you my money for? Um, and and for entrepreneurs to to be able to nail that down in that elevator pitch um, really matters because I bet and, now you know the value you bring. Well, it's funny though, right? Because the value question is simply this: What problem can you solve for me? Hmm. If you can tell the person what problem you can solve for them. And yeah, you do need to spend some time doing some fact finding to figure out what problems they have. But if you can articulate the problem that you can solve for them, you can become valuable very quickly, especially if that problem is creating a lot of pain for the person. Hmm. So good. All right. So obviously let's talk about the collaboration and leveraging relationships. Um, Obviously, I assume that you you continue to collaborate and continue to leverage relationships for for growth. And and let's talk about the power of of building on that. Yeah, I think collaboration is the secret sauce. It's the magic that 
every entrepreneur who grows anything big uses. Uh, you won't have all of the skill sets necessary to achieve the mission that you're placed here to achieve or accomplish. And so, and if you do, I can assure you that you're playing too small and you're ignoring or turning your back on the true calling that you have. It's always going to be bigger than you. And with that said, you don't let that paralyze you. You don't let other people dictate that this isn't going to happen. So for instance, in this situation with me not being able to articulate my value to my partner at that point, I didn't quit. I didn't stop rehabbing. I didn't stop showing up to work. I didn't stop looking at deals. And it was seeds that I had planted in the past that finally grew for me. And I think a lot of times we plant a seed and we watch that seed. We just hover over that seed waiting for it to grow. And that is the fastest way to disappointment because the seed's going to grow when the seed's ready to grow. You can't determine whether or not the seed grows. All you can do is put the seed in the ground, water it, make sure that the weeds are gone. But you need to have multiple seeds, right? There's just no way around it. And so the big thing that I learned, though, is you can't partner with everybody. And so early on, we talked about, well, how do I find a guide? How do I find a mentor, or coach, advisor, counselor? Uh, the same thing goes with your potential partners. You need to make sure that your morals and values align. Hmm. You know, I still remember sitting in a meeting and we were talking about the residents at our property. And one of the people in the room said, hey, we don't want those people there anyway. They're your customers. We want those people there, even if we don't want them full time. And this was, you know, something that signaled to me that, hey, our morals and values are not the same. I don't really care about the socioeconomic status of the person. As long as they are a customer, then we want them there. Now, long term, we may be looking to have other people be our customers. But as long as they're our customers, they're our customers. And I, I don't want people to kind of skip over that. And so that was one of those hard lessons that I had to learn about not truly understanding who you're partnering with. Hmm. Well, and obviously you mentioned character right off the bat in talking about your own experience in, in corporate and and that character that you assumed the leadership had. I mean, to, to let your people go before a holiday for the sake of the corporate numbers and we're laying everybody off. You're like, well, wait, what, you know, that there's that there was definitely a misalignment. And so character has been a, a value for you. So how does character and, and authenticity play out? How do you get to be yourself, be truly you yeah. in, in, in these deals? And yeah, I, I don't hide who I am. Hmm. So I want, who I am to either attract people to me or send them screaming for the hills. I don't want lukewarm and I want people in the middle, right? I want them thrilled, excited about the opportunity to work with me because of who I am as a person or I want them repulsed. And I think a lot of people are like, well, they may not like me and they're worried about that. I can understand that on maybe your religious views or political views. Some of that stuff makes sense. Well, on your true morals and values, I, I am who I am. And if we get in a space, let's be clear, doing a business partnership is like getting married. You're tying your financial future together along with a bunch of other things. And if you don't have the same values, you're setting yourself up for failure because there's going to be a disagreement. You're not going to see the world the same way. And in that, space you will potentially do something erratic and that erratic thing is probably going to cost somebody I'm not going to say you but somebody a lot of money but if you're the one that's having the visceral reaction it's probably going to cost you the money so important so so let's dig into that just a, a little bit more right uh, power of collaboration right you need partners to be able to get do the things that that are necessary. I love earlier you mentioned, you know, 
if you can do it without help, if you can do it without collaboration, you're probably not, you know, playing big enough. Um, and so, uh, what what is the power of having that bigger dream, that that impossible, you know, nearly impossible thing, to yeah. to drive you? Big hairy audacious goal. It if it truly is on purpose, you jump out of bed. <laughs> you're excited to work on it. You. If you're like me, you become obsessed with it, right? And that obsession is healthy when you're applying it against something that's going to improve the state of humanity. Oh. And I think that's what all of us are placed here to do is to make the lives of other people better because of our encounter. But, you know, some of us choose to play at a more primal state. And I understand that. I don't think it's optimal. In fact, I believe it's suboptimal. But if you truly believe that you're here for a reason and you truly value the breath that you have and you feel like you should do something to earn it, then I'm not sure how you can do that with some mediocre or small goal. <laughs> I just don't know how those two go together. When, when you see the way that life can be fleeting somebody that you knew is here today and gone tomorrow usually a really good person i still remember when i, I was 30 and my buddy hambone passed away and i was asking myself how could i still be alive and that guy mm -hmm. pound for pound is one of the best people i've ever met and really started to take inventory on was I living the life that I should be living because I was in a head on accident at 22 where I should have died. I, I don't know why I'm actually still here. I was in a head on accident with a dump truck going 55 miles an hour. Like yet I'm still here. So I should be doing something with the time I have because I know that my life could be over in the blink of an eye. And I've watched other people who I thought expire prematurely. So what are you going to do? How do you make the most of it? Right? Because you, let's assume that you only get one walk on the face of the earth for the sake of simplicity. What are you saving it for? Well, let's talk about the idea of that, that a lot of people have that come from maybe a scarcity mindset that, that they they need to play small so that other people aren't embarrassed or they're playing small to satisfy God. Yeah, I, I hear you. Roger that. But if if we're going to go to the God thing, uh, I think there's a book that says something along the lines of I was made in you, you were made in my image. Now I'm paraphrasing, right? I'm taking some Liberty there, but I, I think it says something around there. I, I think the essence of the message is there. And I don't think anybody's God, whether you believe in Allah, I, I don't believe anybody's God is small in any way, shape or form. In fact, I'm not sure why anybody would be inspired to follow a small God. Right. And so if you're going to be the walking embodiment of God, who are you to play small? Hmm. Who are you? Like, who do you do you not find that being disrespectful to what you're called to be? I. Now, maybe that's not in the book, but I think it is. <laughs> well, I, I, I will say. When you said puny God, it did remind me of the scene where Hulk is taking Loki and bouncing him off the pavement upside down in the Marvel movie and saying, puny God. And so <laughs> the idea, I, I agree, the idea of a puny God is not very inspiring. The idea that that we are created in the image of God really means that that pretty much we're probably all playing small. We should be playing bigger we should be inspiring to do more because we kind of owe it to, to the God that created us and, or co-created us or has given us this incredible gifts of, of creation, right? The ability to make stuff, all the stuff around us 
you know, human beings have had the ability to, to create all of this great stuff. And, and, and so the idea of playing small just seems, I, I mean, on its face, it seems ridiculous. I, you said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, at the end of the day, like, what are we, what are you really doing? Like, I'm sure everybody listening to this knows at least one person who they wish had another breath, mm. at least one. Yet they, they decide to waste theirs. Mm. Like how, who are you and how dare you? Wow. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by the newly released book, Dream Life Planner, Move from Tired and Overwhelmed to Free and Empowered by Noel L. Peterson, available on Amazon, or you can order a personalized signed copy at empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R, to dream.com. That's empower, number two, dream.com. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends. Welcome back. Let's get back to more greatness. Powerful, but... But I think for for many they don't they don't tap into that purpose. They don't find or feel purposeful in their lives. They feel lost. They feel stuck. They feel obligated to the man, right? Obligated to the nine to five. Obligated to, oh, I gotta I gotta pay the rent. I gotta pay the car payment. I gotta buy the groceries. I'm stuck. I can't. How do I get out of this, Jerome? How do I how do I change it? Yeah. So. One, find your guide, right? There are people who will extract you from the matrix. <laughs> Me being one of them. We help you figure out what you're truly supposed to be working on because it's likely that you're not passionate about the thing. And then we have create a plan to help you escape. And then the price of your escape is full on total commitment to the mission and the execution of that. You're in service of that thing. You're beholden to that thing now. And if you're on purpose, then there will always be provision for you. Your gifts will always make room for you. The universe will always provide. You've got to believe that that's true though. You're not a slave, right? You're not captive unless you choose to be. That's a choice. Now, will it will the transition be painful? If you did it like I did, yeah. <laughs> right? It will. It, will you question whether or not you're doing the right thing? Multiple days. Will you ask questions of why am I doing what I'm doing? Without question. I would not tell you anything otherwise because I just wouldn't be being honest with you. But what I can tell you is once you actually taste true freedom, there is no price that will get you back into the bondage or slavery that you feel today. <laughs> well, you mentioned the matrix and of course you're wearing your, I took the red pill shirt. And okay. so that idea, right. Of, of freedom, of, of having a different understanding about money, having a different understanding about how the world works. Why, why isn't it talked about more? Why, why? I, because, I, go ahead. Because the construct is set up in such a way that if we don't discuss the options, then people don't realize that they are available to them. So the greatest hoax of the world is only to present options to people that, that you want them to have. By only presenting that option to them, they believe that this is normal and this is what they're supposed to do. Inherently, we're tribal, right? And so if the tribe is doing the thing, then we feel safe in that. But there's also a subculture, outsiders, people operating outside of popular culture who are actually making the impact that most of us truly desire to have. 
but we choose not to do it because somebody told us that it wasn't practical or that we didn't fit in or that we were at risk of not having health insurance, <laughs> which is always the first question that people get asked when they just say they're not going to have a job anymore. <laughs> There's just so much. And for me, I, I think one of the, the the craziest things is, right, we, we grow up in the matrix. We grow up in, in our tribe and we're told we, you don't talk about you don't talk about sex. You don't talk about money. You don't talk about religion. And and I think there's tribes that are still not talking about money and they're not talking about the interest rate they paid and they're not talking about the fees that they're paying and they're not talking about this extra cost that that the bank has told them, well, that's that's just how it is. And and if they felt the freedom to talk, right? I think people that understand wealth, the people that understand money, they talk about their deals. They talk about, yeah, I got, you know, I'm paying 3% interest on that and I'm I'm paying out 10% interest for this. And and you know, I'm making 7% on the transition. And and they have these conversations about how they're using their money and what the money's doing. And you know, when it's a good deal or not a good deal, because you've had conversations with the other people that are doing similar deals in the same part of town, or they're doing similar deals on the same types of projects. And they know, Hey, we're putting in the good fixtures versus the cheap things, right? Because you've had conversations. And to me, it's crazy that we have entire tribes, entire groups that are afraid to talk about money, that money is taboo, that, 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 yeah learning new things about money. Oh no, that the IRS will get you if you do that, or the government will come after you or, or the bank will take it all. Or I, there's just all of these ideas that just simply aren't true, but nobody's raising their hand and saying, wait, can I, can I ask a question? <laughs> it's the exposure though, right? I think you illuminated the point very eloquently, right? The conversation around the dinner table is different for some people the things that you talk about when you're at cars and coffee or at the golf club course or at the basketball court or, or the conversation is different and that conversation leads to exposure to concepts ideas beliefs that others don't have and so it, the saying of uh, <laughs> knowing, right? Being 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 in the know or knowing is so much more valuable than being fat, dumb, and ignorant, <laughs> from my perspective. <laughs> I mean, because at the end of the day, like those people think they're blissful, mm. and they just have no clue what's going on. Just like all the apps that are free, I don't think people realize that they're the product, right? right? It's free to you because they're selling your stuff to somebody else, whether you want them to have it or not. Nothing is actually free, but, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to do this because it doesn't cost anything. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's always an interesting question. Well, where's the money, right? Who's Where's where's the money? Where's this being paid for? Who's, why are they paying for it? Right. Why <laughs> follow, follow the money and you find the answers to, to those kinds of questions, right? Every Facebook single time is a data company. <laughs> they, they sell data. <laughs> They're Every making time. their money, collecting that data from guess who? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's it. And it's, it's interesting how, we can change the conversations and enlighten people. Like I, I, I mean, I just love that you go straight to it, right? Here's the red pill. <laughs> this changes everything, right? It, it wakes you up and you mentioned that you wouldn't go back in. I call it, you know, the entrepreneurial line. There's a line in the entrepreneurial sand that once you've crossed it, you're unemployable. You, you could never get a job again because you no longer care about the health insurance or the benefits. You're way past that, right? Like those things are easy <laughs> to figure out. Once that, you pass this place of uh, I never, nobody's ever going to tell me what to do <laughs> in a, in a job position again. 
Now I work for my clients and I work for my customers and I let them tell me what to do because they're, they're compensating me pretty well. Well, and what's interesting is do, do, do they tell you what to do or are they hiring you in a capacity where they're coming to you to seek counsel? And for me, it's my, it's my desire to be that person that they turn to for that counsel, right? How do we do this? Okay, well, I believe we should do this, this, and this. Now, they can always say, no, I don't want to. And that's fine. We'll figure out another way where we can support them. But if you're, if you're working hard and becoming that person who's best in industry, uh, they're probably going to listen to you, especially if you charge a lot of money. Because <laughs> it better well, work, right? Right. Well, and and then they work harder, right? The value, the value is an energy exchange. The price is an energy exchange. And so if you have a low price product that's got low value, and it'll be not just perceived low value, it's real value is low because, because you don't value it very high. But you have a high value product and you charge a high value, the person values it much higher when they're making a larger investment and then they're much further engaged in in participating in their own future one thousand percent and i think a lot of people are scared of that but what most folks don't realize is pricing is part of brand pricing is part of brand absolutely so let's talk a little bit more you you mentioned the, the community, you mentioned purpose. Obviously, you're a purpose-driven guy. You, you, you're talked about the good of humanity that, that all of us as entrepreneurs have something inside of us to, to solve a problem, to provide a solution, to, to serve our fellow humans in some yeah. great way. I think every human has that. Entrepreneurs are the ones that tap into it. How is, how is contribution, how has the ability to, to give back been a part of your journey now that you've as a part of taking the red pill. This is what it's all about, sir. Uh, I, man. So that question gives me chills because if you're not contributing, then what are you doing? Right. My, uh, my, one of my affirmation, part of my affirmation is everyone I come in contact with is better because of our encounter. Right. Everybody that I come in contact with is better because of our encounter. They might not enjoy our encounter, but it's my ambition to help them get further along on their journey, whatever that is. Even if it's pointing out something that nobody else will tell them, hey, you got something green in between your front two teeth. <laughs> right. I think that might make their life a little bit better. So the give back, the ability to connect, the desire, the interest in making the human condition better is what my life is all about at this point. When I left corporate America, I made a very distinct decision that I was not going to do things because of money. Right? I would charge money to do things, but I wasn't doing it for the money. Mm -hmm. There always had to be something else. The money was just there to show accountability and to be a measuring stick of value. Mm. That's all it is for. Because at the end of the day, money is only a tool, right? It's not good or bad. In fact, I think it's inherently good, especially if it's in the hands of good people. Absolutely. Because those good people can then use that to amplify messages, fund things that might not get funded otherwise, keep going down the list. At the end of the day, my goal is to have impact. And so we've got this crazy model and the red pill. Yes. We, we talk about the matrix, but the red pill is our model for a centered life. And it's got six levels, right? And those six levels are self-image relationship work. Those first three, we'll stop there. I won't give you all six at once. I don't want to confuse you. Self-image relationship and work. Those are all the stress in your life. Right. And so the first thing we do is we turn down the volume on the stress, because if we can turn down the volume on the stress, then you don't need to numb it. And majority of people that I know who say, hey, I need to take the edge off are not going to go do something healthy. 
In fact, I think they're going to do something that is self-sabotaging, right? They're, they're going to negatively impact their health. So we want to turn that volume so you don't need to numb the highs and the lows. From there, we move into health, which is level four. And when you've eliminated those self-destructive habits, you have the ability to really take your health to peak performance level, right? We can add in meditation. We can add in pick the thing. We can add in all of those things that some people are not including in their life, journaling, uh, affirmations, et cetera. From there, we go to level five, which is prosperity. Well, why don't I get the money then focus on my health? Well, I think everybody knows somebody who had a lot of money, weren't healthy, and they spent all their money trying to get their health back. <laughs> it's, really <too> difficult. <laughs> it's really difficult for me as a guide to go off and guide you into this place where you're going to make this thing that you have to give back to get the other thing. I, I, I have no intention of doing that for folks. And so when you get to level five, most people think they're done because they have self-actualized. They've got money. I've got my health. I got great relationships. I love what I do at work. And I, I like myself. I love myself uh, from a self-image standpoint. And then they're like, okay, what was it all for? I still feel empty. I still I'm looking for this thing. I want my life to matter. And so level six is transcendence. Level six is significance. Level six is immortality. Other people classify it as legacy. And so we help people figure out how to make that move where their breath, their name, their work will live on past them. And this is where you truly find your success in your significance, your significance by positively impacting the lives of other people. And so again, six levels, self-image relationship, work, health, prosperity, and significance. Oh, so powerful. So powerful. All right. We're going to switch things up a little bit. What's your favorite date? Favorite date, man, this is a tough one. You know, <laughs> if I had to pick one date, and I don't actually know, I do know the date. I won't give the year, but March 5th, the day that I got my driver's license, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I, I got all the freedom that I thought I would ever need, right? Because I had the ability to drive my place myself to the places I wanted to go. That was the only birthday that I ever cared about. I don't drink alcohol, so I didn't care about 21. Like that, that that's my favorite date. <laughs> nice. Open up a whole new world for me. Absolutely. So what do you love to do in your free time? Ah, oh, I love cars. Anything that involves cars. Uh, cars and coffee, rallies, car shows. If, if I can be in a community of folks who will who enjoy a good automobile, I feel pretty happy. Nice. I, I happen to to love cars a little bit. Dad, uh, Dad's got a four car shop in the backyard with a, three early Broncos and a and a '66 Mustang. So, oh yeah, we, we tinker around a little. It's just Nothing a way to keep that. keep him and I together. So, and uh, gotta have him, something to do. Keep him busy. That's right. Keep him out of trouble. <laughs> Otherwise, he'd be chasing girls in the bar or something. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I'll tell the secret. Oh, so you mentioned some routine things in there. Um, what are what are some routines that are non-negotiables for you? Oh, journal, meditate, read, practice my Spanish, little jog, uh, then some type of self-development. Uh, podcasts, book, uh, some video on YouTube. Um, you know, th those are the things that I, I do at least five out of seven mornings a week. Nice. All right. What are we practicing the Spanish for? I just like the idea of being able to speak another language. And even if I'm not fluent, being able to understand what other people are saying to me. And the majority of our travel is either... Uh, the Caribbean or Africa. And so 
he just felt like that was the language that was most likely to be spoken if we were in a foreign land. Nice. So I've been to the one little country in Africa that Spanish is their trade language. <laughs> so it's a, it's not a friendly little country, but <laughs> they do speak Spanish as a trade language. So I love uh, both of those places. Lived in South America for 10 years and then wow. traveled to Africa seven times. So love love both those places and hope to go back and take teams to do business development, to share stories like this and encourage yeah. people to 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 believe in themselves and, and believe in possibility and abundance. That's outstanding there. Yeah. That's, cool. so, That's real work. That's mission hope, work there. Hope, hope we're taking Jerome with us in one of these trips. Hey, let's do something. You're, you're learning the Spanish. We'll put it to work. So how important is play and fun? More important than the work. Right? I, you have to enjoy it. Right? I, I know people who I'm on to the next thing, and they're beating their chest about how they didn't celebrate or enjoy the accomplishment or their achievement. And I think there's a fundamental flaw in that approach. Fundamentally, I believe it's flawed. I think we're put here to work, but also to enjoy the fruits of those labors. I, if you can enjoy it, then what was the point? Because anything else, I believe, is just ego. And well, it, ego has a lot of acronyms, a lot of alternative meetings, and, uh, I haven't found one that's positive yet. It's true. It's typically getting in the way. <laughs> Every single time. I still remember I was, I don't know, it must have been 2012 or so. And I wrote a poem called Suicide or Homicide. And it was about getting rid of the ego, right? How do you get rid of your ego so that you're able to serve at a level that most people wouldn't be able to comprehend. And is that suicide or is that homicide? Because it's an inside job. Nobody can do that for you. <laughs> You've got to make that decision. That's definitely an interesting take. It, it absolutely has to be done for yourself. And the idea that, that, you know, I believe the highest frequency, right? is unconditional love. Thousand percent. And, and that's only love, law. Love yeah. without that's love without ego, right? <laughs> yeah. And and we can probably only aspire to be there, but in the aspiration of that, you wrestle with the ego, and and you know we we need pride to be good, we need confidence to to do our work, and so there there's always that wrestling match between, you know, pride and humility. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about your teaching now. You're you're an educator, right? You're, you're helping other people mm-hmm. take the red pill <laughs> and, yeah. and also you're equipping them through their own opportunities to participate in, you know, purchasing multifamily properties and, and, and providing, you know, housing, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it, it, it's a system designed to benefit everybody involved, right? Thousand tenants, percent. tenants get good housing at an affordable price. Investors get, you know, property that, that you know, creates a rev- you know, monthly revenue and, and they're providing a service to, to clients. Um, and, and so it really can be situations where it's win, win, win. Um, and I think so many people think, oh no, if I buy an apartment building, I have to rip everybody off to make any money. <sighs> it's just not true. <laughs> it's just not true. Uh, you have to buy it properly. Now, can you overpay the person that owns the property and then make money if you rewarded them for work that they didn't do? Hmm. No. Right. But that's not the resident's problem. That's your problem because you didn't do a good job of protecting your interests in that conversation or that negotiation. And you probably did it because you just walked walked down the street and decided that you should buy this property without having anybody to guide you through the process to make sure that you have the chance that potentially make some money. (laughs) The beautiful thing about multifamily is it's not a widget. You've actually got to run a business. And if you pay too much on the entry, 
your debt service is going to eat you up. And that in and of itself is a mistake that you can't fix unless you rip people off. And I'm not sure that you didn't know that you were doing that before you got into the deal because it's simply a math problem, right? All of the, all of these transactions are math problems and then you can deal with all the other stuff. But if the math doesn't work, it's not magically going to work because you bought the property. It doesn't fix itself. These are things that you know when you go in. But the whole intention, right? The whole design is to make a good deal on the property, fix sure. the property up for a value price and yeah. but fix it correctly and then offer valuable property, you know, to good tenants. And and everybody can win, everybody can benefit. It can be a win-win-win transaction for the investors, for the property developer and for the residents. 1000%. Right? And so I, I wanted to poke and prod people a little bit, but yes, <laughs> in the concept Conceptually, if you do this properly, you pay an appropriate or a fair price for the property, which means you're not letting the previous owner rip you off. And then you go in and you properly budget and you pay your contractors and your property manager appropriately. If you know what market rent is and you're charging fair rent for the property, everybody, if you do it right, gets a fair deal. And there will be profit for you on the back end, mm-hmm. without a shadow of a doubt. So good. All right, Jerome, what inspires you? This crazy mission that I'm on to free 100 people from work they're not passionate about gets me out of bed every morning. And I'm, I'm looking for those folks who are raising their hand. And it may, they might not be raising it high, but they're asking this question when they look in the mirror. It's one of two. Same question to me, but one of two. Is this it? Or what's it really for? Same question to me. For people, they're asking one of those two questions. I'm looking for each and every one of you because I can help you and get answers. It's so good. So is that your big dream or do you have a bigger dream? No, that's my big, hairy, audacious goal. Because if I help those people, they're going to set millions and millions of people free. That's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. That's legacy. Thousand percent. Mm. So good. It's so much bigger than me. And that's kind of the point, right? If I can touch the people who are going to touch the people, that pebble that gets dropped in the pond ripples for miles. <laughs> so let's touch on, on the power of gratitude in, yeah. in your own life. And then of course, yeah. you know, I think when you're helping people get to transcendence, there's a, there's a severe understanding of, of gratitude. Yeah. So, Gratitude is everything, right? You're, I, I still remember going through a, a court case and feeling like everybody, including my attorney, was there to take everything that they could from me. I had bank accounts frozen for multiple years, had people paint me to be this person who I was not. And if you had a conversation with anybody, who spent more than five minutes with me would know that none of these things were actually true. We, we go th- through that. And for the life of me, I can't understand why I'm being attacked the way I'm being attacked. And I'm so grateful for that. I, I'm so grateful for that experience. I'm so grateful for what, those requirements that were placed on me on the back side of that did for the way that I saw the world and what was possible for me. Uh, I, 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 I'm grateful for my ability to forgive and understand what people will do when I know they're desperate. 
And that for me just gives me a whole new outlook on life. And it also gives me this insatiable desire to achieve more than anybody believed was possible after they piled all of that stuff on top of me. Mm. You talked about a seed earlier, or maybe I did. They buried a seed. And I promise you, this oak tree that's going to come from the seed that was buried is going to make people wish that they might have been a little bit nicer <laughs> because they just miss out on all of the fruit of that tree. They miss out on all of it. And what they got when they took what they took, it's a fraction. Hmm. It's not even it's not even noticeable anymore. Man, that's so good. All right, so you spent the last hour with a, an entrepreneur and shared together, and you want to leave him with Jerome's words of wisdom. What would you share? Your dream should be real. And if you haven't heard that recently, if you haven't heard that since you were a kid, you are now responsible for it. You made it all the way to the end of this episode. And now I got you. You can't get away from that. That thing's going to haunt you, keep you up at night. If you're not actually walking in purpose and doing what you're supposed to be doing, that dream doesn't get dropped on you. If you don't have capacity to do it. And so you ignoring it, you're potentially sabotaging somebody who's counting on you to do that thing. Mm. And I, I don't, I don't ever want to be the person that let somebody else down. Man. So powerful. Jerome, thank you so much for taking the time today. What a great conversation. I appreciate you. And uh, man, you, you dropped some, some heavy wisdom and shared from your heart. And I really appreciate it. So grateful for the opportunity. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, or leave a review. We have a free gift for you at addvaluemindset.com. That's addvaluemindset.com. We've collected some of the best mindset secrets shared by successful entrepreneurs on our podcast, and we want to give them to you for free. addvaluemindset.com. In our next episode... Dr. Barb Hewson and Robert talk about dance and the power of movement in changing the brain. Dr. Barb has a secret acronym she uses with dance to help people understand the need for personal growth and development. We also share a little bit in common about mediating and marriage.